everyone. I think we'll go ahead and get started. We may have some more people drift in, but that we do not want to punish those who came on time. And that would be you. So, um, my name is Penny Wright. I work at the library here. I'm in charge of adult programs, and we are really pleased to be associated with, with Drawdown and with the wonderful guests who have come in at various times to speak on important topics. I would also like to mention that our library is going green, and one of the reasons we are going green, well, is Drawdown, and Joanna Farron, who's at the camera, is the person on our staff who is most active in working toward these goals. So if you have any ideas or concerns about the library and how we're doing things and how we're changing, uh, talk to Joanna. Most of you, uh, we are familiar faces, some of you are not. For those of you who aren't living in our library district, just we invite you to take a library newsletter. Uh, March or eight, March and April is out there. And if you happen to join the Friends of the Library, you will get all of our newsletters in the mail. And we actually have quite a bit going on here, so lots of people join just, just to get the newsletter. Um, wanted to mention a couple of things that are going on that are slightly related, and you're here at a good time to hear about them. We have a series, um, a bi-monthly series, that runs from March through November, uh, sponsored by the Foreign Policy Association. It's called Great Decisions. Every, uh, at every meeting, there's a different topic. The next meeting is on March 30th, next door in Cooper Hall at 11.30. We really do like reservations for these programs because this is gonna be packed. It's in the boardroom. So take a flyer, consider coming, and then make your reservation if you can come. Ellen Greaves, who is known to many of you, or some of you, will come in on March 11th and do a demonstration using, you know, making soup out of available items in your refrigerator. So we do, we do require reservations uh, on these food programs. And the, um, some of you may have seen this very, what we thought, what I thought was one of the most powerful films I have ever seen. It's called True Cost. And it was Joanna who brought this to, to my attention. She said, you must see this film. It's about, it's, it's really about clothing and the production of clothes worldwide. And I saw it and I was just blown away by this film. So we had a little tiny film series and we showed this film and we had maybe three people come. And so we said, mm -mm, no, no, we're gonna show this again. We're really gonna try to get people to come. So we changed the time. Some of our films are at three in the afternoon. This is at six on April 20th, take a flyer. It's 90 minutes long, please come to this film. We all shop. This is such an important topic. And the last thing I wanna quickly mention is that we, Joanna and I had a meeting yesterday with Jen Keller, who. Uh, many of you know, she is just wonderful. She's an environmental studies teacher at the high school, and she is such a terrific person. She's gonna make three visits here this summer. And the first visit on July 13th, and we'll, we'll publicize this in our newsletter, so I would say don't even write this down uh, in case we change our dates, but July 13th, she's gonna come to talk about how you can make your yard into a wildlife, but you can get it certified, into a wildlife refuge or a nature preserve. I could have my words wrong, but it, it's kind of a cool thing. And then on August 24th, she'll talk about you know making your yard into a little farm. And then on September 21st, she'll come and talk about regenerative agriculture, which I believe she spoke about before and people thought it was great. So we'll have her back. So that's, it'll pay to have your Rogers Memorial Library next time. <laughs> So, but as we proceed now, I just want to introduce somebody you, you probably know, not as well as I do, because she is my sister, <laughs> Dorothy Riley, who's the co-chairman of the uh, Drawdown East End. Okay, Dorothy. Thank you, Penny, for putting on these amazing programs, the best librarian programmer anywhere around. Um, 
I am so excited to be here with all of you, and obviously you know you're the cream of the crop, because it's not just Drawdown East End, but this is a meeting about policy. And so you are very special people, and I am so privileged to have been able to work with these fellows and to be introducing them to you. Mark Haubner found his passion at age 50, so it's not too late for many of us. Uh, he found his passion, and it was environmental advocacy. So he's not only on the North Fork Civic Association, he's also on the North Fork Environmental Council and the Town of Riverhead Environmental Advisory Committee and Drawdown East End Steering Committee, and he is a sustainability committee in Southampton. He, 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 he has moved beyond Riverhead. Dogs love him, kids love him, and guess what? This is a very interesting I, I learned tonight. He has ordered that when he dies, he's going to be buried in a mycelium suit. And the fungus and the, the mushrooms go down into the earth, and he is going to become compost. And I'm going to do the same thing, Mark. Which makes me a really fun guy. <laughs> And Rob has been heading up our drawdown policy team, spending night and day and night and day uh, to create this uh, great grid, this growing uh, East End Climate Action Plan with Mark and several others. He is an architect, he's a visual artist, and the way he sees visual art is different, I think, than most of the rest of us because he sees it as stretching him and informing him and teaching him how he grows. He also has the great fortune to be married to a beekeeper even though he's allergic to bees, which is an interesting symbiotic relationship that they have. But thank you so much for putting this program together. I really look forward to it. Can you hear me okay? No. Louder? No? Louder? How's that? Okay. The title is Growing and East End, but it's also Growing a East End, Growing a Climate Action Plan, just to make that clear, because it's a little foreshadowing of what we're going to talk about, and that's the scales of involvement that we as individuals are, can, if we want to, involve in perhaps the most important set of decisions as citizens as members of this community, and that's to care for the very future and survival of our area, but also the world itself. So let's get started. Well, let's get started this morning. Okay, so just to quickly go over the presentation, we're going to go over four things. We're going to transform or grow the Climate Action Plan, but we're going to, under, underneath that, we're going to uh, talk about fearlessness. Because we know that if you're here, you are concerned about a subject that sometimes overwhelms you. And we know that that overwhelmness, that concern, can sometimes make you fearful. But we hope to transform that into fearlessness. That's a common theme or important theme in Paul Hawkins, who is uh, deeply connected and perhaps the most important person associated with all them. We're also going to talk about language. The terms that you are familiar with, no doubt, uh, are used in common parlance to mean a lot of different things. And often they don't mean the same thing. And we want to discuss, and thank goodness Mark is here, because he's going to take us through some of the terms that um, to build our understanding, because if we think that will transform us, our understanding in uh, our consciousness as well. I also want to look at the transformation of the region and ourselves. This number, 100,000, its significance will grow as this conversation goes on. It's roughly the population of the East End, which is about 150,000. We also want to transform ourselves, which is at the unit of one, as um, we'll see the significance of that later. And finally, we, we want to save some time to have conversations uh, either about this material or whatever subject that, uh, that you'd like. So Mark is going to talk about our situation and take us through language. I'm going to talk about some solutions 
the scale from global to local, and what these plans reveal about ourselves, our attempts to be successful at creating viable plans that can be implemented, that can change our future and how we deal with global warming. And finally, what does transformation look like? We're going to suggest some ways forward because sometimes it's overwhelmingly disheartening to think that we can't make a difference, that we can't collectively make a difference or individually make a difference. So we want to look at what that transformation looks like. I came across an email uh, I sent to a friend back in 2009, uh, the other night actually, telling her confidently that global warming and climate change was a dilemma that we had to solve. I looked up the word dilemma 10 years later, last week, to find that it is a situation in which a difficult choice has to be made between two or more alternatives, especially equal undesirable ones. A lot of us are in a quandary while we consider our plight. We define the elements of our predicament, but we're not in a dilemma. Being trapped in a burning car at the bottom of a river is a dilemma. But because we've created a plethora of possibilities for ourselves which will alleviate all our predicaments, this is no longer a dilemma. And so we are aware of our situation, and that's why we're here tonight. We're faced with a mountain of interrelated issues, and we're going to look at the tools and attitudes and work required to address them all. Our situation is shared across the community, the country, the globe, but not equally. With the shared fate comes a shared responsibility to act and to make sure that I can look my grandson in the eye 20 years from now and not to say we did the best we could, but that we did all the right things to give you the best world we could. With this immense challenge comes great opportunity, meeting the challenge to go to the moon in 10 years or to colonize Mars in 30 or to bring our planet back to health by 2050. We have all the tools we need to do this, and that's why we're here tonight. Drawdown is the point at which more greenhouse gases are drawn out of the atmosphere than are added, the point of drawing down the CO2 in our atmosphere which will result in the reversal of global warming. I was working in a very large bank and they spent a lot of big money to discover that it took $1 to invest now to keep a customer and it took $7 of costs in the future to acquire a new customer. Now, if they'd only listened to my grandmother, who said an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, they would have saved a lot of time. Of the 80 proven methods that Project Drawdown has identified, fully 40 of these are practicable and economically viable in our region. We have these very same tools and methods and strategies available to us right now, the dollar ones. And using the 100,000 people in our region, we can make them happen, but we need to act yesterday and really put our shoulders to the wheel to get this done. There are a couple of terms on here which I, I take issue with. Uh, global warming is one of them. It sounds too friendly. It's uh, planetary overheating has led to climate disruption. But we had to look at the root cause of the overheating. Simply put, we've knocked the carbon cycle out of kilter with our fossil carbon party over the last 170 years, and more critically, over the last 70. We're burning gigatons of CO2, methane, sulfur dioxide, and more, pushing us further and further over budget every year. And it's hard to recognize an enemy while it's wearing the cloak of invisibility. Renewable energy resources, another thing I have trouble with. That's the second one. Uh, where did that go? Here we go. They sound like magic and a silver bullet, but we have to know that it takes truckloads of iron reinforcing bar and concrete to make a base for a wind turbine. It takes thousands of degrees of heat to make glass and gouging out tons of material to get pounds of rare earths and heavy metals for our solar panels. We need to keep this in mind when we create these rebuildables that they have a life cycle, which may be far short of 30 years, and we're going to have to rebuild them again and reclaim the elements of the old ones to rebuild the new. We also have a tendency to see this extra energy not as a replacement for fossil carbons, but an extra energy paycheck which everyone's willing to spend right away. Mitigation comes before everything else. It's the precursor to resilience and adaptation. 
Think seawalls and floodgates and putting your hands out onto the dashboard just before the crash. Resilience is called bounce back, where we pick ourselves up and build it back, New York strong, going back to our old job after the lights come back on. Not so for the shrimpers of Maine or the cod fishermen of the Cape of no cod. Adaptation comes next where the fishermen go to work in Home Depot, or the houses on the 100 mile sandbar south of Long Island go up on stilts to escape the wrath of the next storm. Sustainability comes when the entire 400 family community of New Jersey accepts a federal and state buyout of all their properties and they go somewhere else. And so for the Avery Island people in Louisiana who have been making McElhenney Tabasco sauce for 150 years are now losing their homes, their jobs, and their identity to sea level rise. When you lose your identity, there is no resilience. You don't come back. We'll talk some of restoration today as it applies to the Peconic Bay region, referring to the work that needs to be done to reestablish healthy habitat, clean water, and stem the tides of sea level rise. Finally, regeneration must be the new social norm. Regeneration must be the new social norm. Not just replacing eelgrass where it's been devastated by harmful algal blooms from our nitrogen wastes, but creating a place where the eelgrass and the alewife and the scallops all thrive again. The Peconic Estuary Partners are using the slogan 1950 by 2030. I've named this bounce forth. All the while, a transformation is going on which tempers the timeline of our actions. Mitigation, resilience, and adaptation are reactive, where restoration and regeneration are proactive. And that's the set of conditions we want to create. We have spent the last 150 years in a take, make, use, and waste linear system, and we're paying the price for our degeneration. This planet thrives as a system where waste from one being becomes food for another, and we must now relearn to mimic this amazing and perfect system. Our new systems must not be just circular, but interconnected, and allow for a materials flow which actually regenerates life itself. I've been recycling since I'm 11 year old, which my daughter tells me is about 90 years. My setting an example with Volkswagen sized mountains of cardboards and four garbage cans full of wine bottles at the curb on Wednesdays has not changed my neighbor's behavior any. I have not single handedly create, created a new social norm. In the last several weeks, the news from the Waste Management Gazette has been that the recycling industry is collapsing on itself. Our backs are up against the wall, and we're going to need to reduce our consumption, plain and simple. At least start with the packaging that we require for our millions of Amazon purchases. The last two landfills on Long Island are closing in the next two or three years. And we're taking all of our glass recycling right now and crushing it as caps on these landfills because we don't want to pay to haul our empty beer bottles to Ohio. Handwriting is on the wall. The names are yours and mine. We can't blame China for their 2017 national sort policy. This is a personal responsibility issue. On the heels of this, we're going to, Rob is going to explore pathways to our success in all of this, many of which may seem linear and arithmetical on the surface, because we can only work in 2D with a spreadsheet, but which we must accelerate to become exponential and spherical in their force. Rob? Thank you, Mark. Mm -hmm. Many of you are familiar with a climate action. Raise your hand. That's a great number. make everyone familiar with climate action plans before it's all over. If the information is kind of dense, bear with me, hang in there. The simplest way for me to describe what a climate action plan is an action framework to measure, plan, and reduce greenhouse gas or their equivalent. It typically involves a governmental entity. And it depends upon the scale in which we're talking about. The state of New York has a climate action plan. East Hampton has a climate action plan. So the two components of the East Hampton climate action plan. One is that it must account for all of its operations and its facilities. Who commutes to work? How much heat does it take to, keep, to make the buildings warm? Those kinds of considerations. 
that is a fraction of what the entire commitment of a carbon load for the town of East Hampton might be. So the second calculation is for the town itself, all of its inhabitants. So you can imagine for these various plans that might be in place, say the New York plan, or the, or the, the county plan, or the state plan, excuse me, the town plan, they're overlapping scales. They involve different groups that need to somehow work together to have understanding of how things are going to be accomplished. There are going to be individual actions. There may be compulsory actions that may be driven by laws that change human behavior. So the question for us is at what scale are these actions most effective and why? That's the kind of thing that we want to explore. So there are a few components of any climate action plan. If you're going to test the veracity of if you're going to test its efficacy, you're really going to look at whether it's going to be effective or not. It's going to have some key components. The first thing is you've got to measure the amount of greenhouse gas or its equivalent in some geographic area. Second, you have to identify an inventory of the key sectors. For example, out here, transportation is a huge burden for us. Imagine the amount of people who move back and forth just to work. Compare that to a community where most of the people who live and work in the same place is a much diminished, less demand to drive, therefore producing fewer greenhouse gases. So this is a jurisdiction. It's it's probably a city. It has eight things that they've identified, and in this case, on-road transportation makes up 50% of what they think the total burden is. The total carbon load is 50 percent. Now, this is probably not an agricultural committee, a community, excuse me. For if it were, you would see that as part of the pie chart, but it's not. So it's not just enough to identify the areas in which you think you have carbon burden but you've got to actually figure out how you're going to change the equation. How are you going to reduce the emissions? And historically, we thought about it in three things. We're going to reduce demand, like Mark described. We're going to employ some certain efficiencies, and we're going to adopt some new methods. So let's go back to our community here. If we have on-road car transportation, excuse me, if we have on-road transportation, Let's look at the subset of cars. How are we going to reduce the demand, increase efficiency, or adopt some new method? But this is what every community has to do. If they're going to produce a climate action plan, they've got to actually break down these things. They have to know or at least estimate what, in fact, is going to transpire. So you have to figure out the total by greenhouse gas for all transportation. You have to figure out the percentage or estimate the percentage of the car and how are you going to reduce demand? Well, I'm going to drive 10% less. So if you're trying to figure out how you're going to solve the solution, suppose everybody just agrees to drive 10% less. Or suppose we're going to buy a car that's going to have our gas efficiency. Or suppose we're going to adopt a new method, we're going to drive an electric vehicle, like our friend Dar. But those things don't mean anything to us, really, unless we're talking about how we're going to reduce those levels over time. So back to our problem. If we're trying to solve a climate crisis, we need to think in terms of years, and we need to think in terms of decades. And the significance of 2030 is this. It's estimated we need to reduce on a worldwide basis our total emissions by 50% in 10 years. And then in the next decade, we have to produce, reduce it 50% more. And on the third decade, we have to do it 50% more. That's, 
exponential thinking. Right? So if you don't accomplish what you need to in the first year, you can't build on it the second year. This is not as if you can make it all up in the fourth quarter when your team is behind. You've got to do it incrementally. So in each one of these target areas, you've got to decide just how much you're going to reduce it. Imagine this community, it has a 50% burden that's on transportation. It can't afford to be too far off that number because of the percentage that this makes up as the total. So we're going to reduce demand. Maybe there are alternatives, maybe a walk, ride a bike, electric vehicles, public transportation. Those kinds of decisions we're going to have to weigh in, both on our individual decisions but our collective decisions. So maybe we're going to increase efficiency. It's not enough for me to make a selection of buying a different car. Maybe we're going to expect the cafe standards to kick in and demand that the federal government change those things. What are those assumptions that you're going to put into this calculation? And finally, about the new methods, if we're going to try to target 50% as a community, may I just change my whole personal attitude about transportation? Or maybe I would expect the, the government to sunset the very use of a combustion engine itself for automobiles. So that was a city or some municipality. This is the country of Germany. <laughs> so we're talking about a similar thing. The significance here is they estimated, based upon the, those five industries, energy sector, industry, transportation, building, and agriculture, they estimated the total load today and where they think they have to get to in 10 years. Now, mind you, we were saying a 50% reduction in 10 on a worldwide basis. And as good as Germany is, you can see that, that this estimate of 562 is not 50% of that number. You can see where agriculture is a very small percentage, but we didn't talk about agriculture for the other municipalities. But where they have the biggest burden is on the energy sector, and although they've made strides with abandoning nuclear power, they still rely heavily on coal. So it's a conundrum. It's not an easy thing to figure out. So if we're going to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, think of it as a business. But suppose your business was not profitable. It needed to return it to profitability. And the only way you thought to do it was to reduce your expenses. That's analogous to what we're trying to do by reduce our output of greenhouse gases. If that's all we're trying to do, then we're going to have a difficult time solving the problem. We actually need some income. And the income, if you will, in this analogy, is sequestration. And it's one of the things that's perhaps it's not something new to draw down, but it's one of the things that's critical to draw down as an idea that's permeating our consciousness today, and that is it's not just enough to reduce demand and like. We need to take advantage of the healthy, regenerative natural systems that Mark referred to because they act as carbon sinks. It's particularly important here because the way that that is done is through forest wetlands and our soils. And unlike a lot of communities where we're close to the water, the significance of those things were remarkable. If you change, depending, if, you, if we don't have healthy forests, if our trees are dying in our, in our villages and the like, if they're not being replaced, they can't do that work. If we're over aggressive with actually allowing too much clearing of land, they can't act as a natural carbon sink. It's okay. I was just going to make another comment about wetlands and soils, agricultural practices. Regenerative agricultural practice fundamentally changes the amount of, of fertility in the soil, but also changes the amount of moisture the soil holds. And it decreases the ability to be a carbon sink. And a lot more is being known about the value of land as a carbon sink, particularly if the soils are healthy. So that gets into land practices about whether you're going to change them or not. All right, so the last component piece of what you need to look for, I'd suggest that you look for, in a, a robust climate action plan, is whether you measure and monitor the results. 
So most of the plans that you're familiar with, if you're not accounting for it, if you're not keeping up with what you said you were going to do, then you don't know how to make adjustments. You don't know how you're doing. There's no way that you can say to your community or to each other whether you're actually achieving what you set out to do. All right, so very quickly, we want to look at different scales. We're familiar somewhat with Project Drawdown. The exponential roadmap is, is actually a precursor to Drawdown. They are very close in their methodologies and the like. So we'll see, just briefly, introduce you to that. Now, at the state level, the Climate Smart Communities is a program set up. It's not a climate action plan per se. It's to help communities build climate action plans. So we'll look at the framework there to see its relevance to making a climate action plan, both in, in its setup, but also in its reality. This county level one is the Comprehensive Conservation Management Plan, that's the Conic Estuary Program. Now that's not a climate action plan per se, but it does deal with a variety of things that relate to global warming. And the Sustainability 400 we'll talk about, and we're gonna introduce a, a personal, the idea of a personal climate action plan for us. So the scales are going from global of 10 million people, roughly, billion people, down to one. All right, um, there's a lot of information here, kind of death by information, but I want to point out just a couple of things here. One is that, one is that these, under Project Drawdown, there are seven sectors that they concentrate on. Now, we're in a sense trying to correlate these other plans to what drawdown, the terminology of drawdown. Now, in the climate smart communities, they don't actually have a, a sector that says, or an action that says buildings and cities or buildings. So there's several aspects to those. So in examining these plans, if you look at them, if you ignore the titles to things and look at the intent, you can better correlate what they're trying to achieve in these plans. So over here in the Sustainability 400, there isn't something that addresses food per se, but they do talk about waste and land use. So again, you have to know the, what they're trying to accomplish and you can see where they correlate. Now, we put the Conley Gestory Program in here it's an emphasize of clean water and healthy ecosystems because we think although they don't identify buildings per se, you cannot have this if, you're, if you are not mindful of the buildings or the energy or the other issues that you have in your community. Good. Yes. All right. Very quickly, we've we discussed, we introduced Project Drawdown already, but I want to point out this science-based and net cost and operational savings calculator. Because so often you hear, we can't do something because it's going to cost us too much. So what Drawdown tried to do, or has done, is to rigorously and scientifically look at a 30-year span in which the cost and the savings are calculated for each of those 80 solutions. And it's remarkable that the savings outwent on most of them and outwent on net. So when you hear we can't do something, that's probably not as accurate as looking at what the true cost will be for the decades. And the other thing I would say is that what's valuable about that analysis is you can look at the cost versus the savings and, and essentially do a calculation to find out what your return on investment is. And some of them are remarkable. For example, as significant as wind turbine is maybe for us as a percentage, whether it's offshore or onshore, onshore wind turbines are remarkably better return on investment if that was part of your solution.
All right. We are suggesting, or at least for tonight, we're suggesting there may be as many as 50. Mark referred to 40. There could be as many as 50 locally applicable solutions. All right. Drawdown, it, it looks at a worldwide impact. But if we're going to make sense out of what we think are 50, we have to know their relevance on a local basis. Because we just can't assume if refrigeration is the most significant impact, that that's the thing that we need to be most concerned about locally. It could well be, but you have to think, we have to figure out what its local impact is. So, and if we can do that, we can build better climate action plans. All right, again, so this is a simplification of what we were looking at earlier. It has, you'll see the seven sectors for drawdown, and these we think are the relevant ones for our area. Now, nuclear is there. The reason why it's in white is it's not the kind of thing, probably, that we locally are going to have any impact, whether we have it or not. It's going to be probably part of our ongoing solution, but it's not likely to be something we're going to alter unless we're someone like Carol Williams, who's had, a, had great success at making sure that that didn't enter into our equation. Okay, so we're going to pull back, remember this little diagram, this community here, and look at the number of solutions. Now obviously they're within on-road transportation, you could look at trucks or buses or, or, or automobiles, but it's almost bereft by comparison to drawdown. This is a more conventional way of looking at how, what the contributing factors are. And one of the things that, that makes drawdown so promising is the, tool, the toolkit is so large and the research is so good. We mentioned exponential roadmap before. They have slightly different headings. We'd like to point out that they are suggesting 36 solutions, seven of which are carbon sinks, what we discussed earlier with sequestration, and they're right here. The ones that are in white are the ones on a worldwide basis may be significant, they have no applicability locally. We're not gonna be worrying about peatland protection in our area, but we are gonna be worried about reforestation and improved agricultural practices and improved forest management and agroforestry, perhaps. We should go back, that's okay. Now, again, what they've rigorously gone after, this chart is there are three separate sectors of these over here. This is today, this is 10 years from now, this is 100% of whatever the burden is per sector, this is how they're getting to half of that. And so you would actually look at and study what all of their assumptions are to see if they're realistic. So anyone putting together a carbon action plan is gonna break down and try to describe every assumption that they're making within a particular area. Okay, um, at the town level, Town Solution Sustainability 400 is a significant effort and document. Uh, it, I'm not intended in any way, this is not in any way to single out the work of Southampton, but it's, a, it's something that's near and dear to us. Uh, and it, 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 we said in the beginning, we want to look at these plans to, to understand what they say about us. And in the mission statement, this is from 2013, so this is a while ago, ensure, I N, ensure the future of the town and define our own destiny. Nothing about that that suggests that we're looking, working on a climate action plan, right? This is like the first sentence in the first paragraph of the document. But down in the body of the document, or I should say, actually on the, I think it's on the first page, is become carbon neutral. That's a climate action plan. 
that's committing to conserving efficiency and alternative energy sources by 2040 with an interim goal of 30 percent by 2020. Wait a minute, that's today, right? So what you're seeing here is a tug and pull within a community to, to define what it's going to do. This is not uncommon because this, this effort to ensure the future define our own destiny. And resilience meaning to sustain the town's beauty, culture, and history. That's a different approach to this message at the bottom. So it reflects the tug and pull that every community goes through to decide what it's going to achieve. Okay, even more information. Again, I'm correlating it here to the, in this case, the six parts of drawdown. I've left out women and girls, not because of the significance, but because of how it correlates here. So <clears throat> what you're seeing is there are, in, if you were to look at the 400 plus, you would actually see sections that are under the green building heading. But it, there are many other sections, education, water, economics, quality of life, and stewardship, that regardless of how they're described over here organizationally, they're relevant to these headings. So there are many of the, of the items here are populating these sections here that relate to drawdown because that's the intent. That's the, that would be the net effect. And some of these are programs, some of them are studies, some of them are promised, but these are identified. The significance here is there are four things in here in orange that speak to climate action plans. Now, one of the difficulties of 400 plus was there wasn't a prioritization of mechanism by which to help organize all these things. So consequently, they've had some difficulty. They go after things that are significant to the group and to the year, but there's not this sort of overarching prioritization that was embedded into the plan. But there was in the plan elements that we can identify that correlate to a climate action plan. Okay, what is this? In blue, you see all the things that directly correlate, that directly correlate to draw down. So heat islands, less so, but environmental restoration, very much so. So just, this is to give you just the scale of what's already been decided on or agreed to as a community that's significant to us. It's already correlated. It's already it says we understand or sympathetic. So I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel here, I'm not to convince anyone of something. This just shows the, the sympathy and the uh, agreement, if you will, as to what these various strategies might be within green building. All right, state solution. This is a little bit later. We mentioned that 400 plus was in 13. So again, Southampton became a climate smart community in 17. The state created this program much earlier because they realized that communities were having difficulty implementing plans. So we, they said, we're going to give you a framework. Remember I said in 400 plus, there wasn't a prioritization. It was difficult. It's so many things to do to really identify what needed to be done and when. So they said, we'll help you. The key down here I want to point out is this subset of actions fundamental to the successful local program. Now this is a certification program, so some of the things they say are mandatory and some of the things are priority. Ah, more information. Okay, two groups, general requirements, and all the other requirements. 
And again, we are assigning not so much by the title of it, but to the outcome. So under decreased energy use, we could identify five things that would fall into that category. The significance of the red ones, inventory greenhouse gas G, that's government. Inventory greenhouse gas C, that's the whole community. Climate action plan government, climate action plan community. Recognize those? Those are the elements of a climate action plan. And these other ones are as well. Energy audits over here. Remember we said we're going to monitor things, right? So these are all the things within the general requirements. And the other thing over here is build a climate smart community, a task force. These two are mandatory. So these are the current requirements. So I'm going to show you what the town did in 2017. All right, they got bronze certification. And everything in green is what they got points for. This is not a criticism, but this is, again, just to illustrate the difficulty that communities have in implementing these plans. This is a great success, because there are only like 32 in the whole state. But again, look at what, was, what they achieved points for. Did not achieve points for the things that set up a climate action plan. So if the point of the program is to assist communities create climate action plans, didn't do it. It does help with funding, does help with insurance. There are real benefits for doing this, but it wasn't a strategic plan that helped them actually implement these things. Okay, so we're to transformations. What is required of us as individuals, as communities, towns, you name it. What is required of us to transform or make a difference? We're going to offer a few suggestions. Okay. You've got a handout. And this is one of them. <clears throat> so local solutions, these are the drawdown local solutions. Scales of optimization. This comes from some work that was done to try to analyze the efficacy of drawdown. At what scale of community was it going to be most successful to implement these things? So P0, we're talking about exponential things now. So P0 stands for one, one person. P1 is a one with a zero or 10 people. The significance of that is that's an extended family, right? So look at all the things that have scales of optimization or relevance across different populations. This is one person. P5 is significant because that's 100,000. That's in the order of magnitude of everyone on the east end. So we're suggesting that these are all the things that are relevant to do or could be in our community. These are the scales of optimization for each one of those things. So it starts to lay out a plan for how you might create a personal climate action plan. If you were to take all the things under these two categories and you look at them and say, hmm, maybe we should be focusing on those things as individual concerns. If we're looking to create a regional climate action plan, an East End climate action plan, the reason why we're suggesting it's an East End climate action plan is because it doesn't know a boundary. And we know that there's scales of operation that work across P2, which is basically a hamlet of our community, uh, CAC, up to P5. So these numbers represent sort of the sweet spot of efficacy. Ah, so what I said earlier, growing an East End, I'll get it right, and East End Climate Action Plan. If you look at what's highlighted in green, we're really talking about the scale of governmental organization. Or if not governmental organization, we're talking about communities, churches, 
associations down at this level. We put some question marks in here because we think that net zero buildings are of some consequence for us. Every building we build today will be operational in 2050. So it needs to either be carbon neutral now or we're going to retrofit it sometime between now and then. What's the pick? All right, so in this analysis that we drew on here, they didn't decide where the sweet spot was for some of these things, but we think it has relevancy in these things. For example, down here, energy distri distributed energy, energy storage, grid flexibility, and microgrids, we think they have relevancy for our community. And we think it's in the purview of the towns to figure that out. Okay, growing and east end climate action plan. So this is again the simplification of all the things that we looked at. Okay, so what are we challenging the local governments to do? Create a climate action plan. I could say create a damn climate action plan or some other explanation here or, or explanation. This needs to be done. It needs to be done now. If we're going to reduce our carbon footprint as a community by 50% in a decade, we need this now. It's not okay for it to be created three years from now. We would like to see it coordinated off, across all five towns because we think it has scale across all five towns. We think it is relevant because it optimizes the actions that we need to take because we need rapid transformation. And we also want local governments to build understanding. We want, us to, we want a conversation about what it means to be resilient, what resiliency means and what that commitment will be, versus what we're going to do to address global warming. So on the personal, the local solution scales of optimization, optimization, we'll talk a bit about personal climate action plans. We're going to see what that looks like. Again, they're shaded here for the first two, P0 and P1. We're going to simplify this chart for a personal climate action plan. Okay. Now, this, we're, we're suggesting there are two th things here that are relevant. Individual agency, that's me to you. That's everybody that you have personal contact with. Your influence, your ideas, we think that that happens most relevant. It's called individual agency at the scale of one person to ten. And we think the social agency with larger scales of contact that relate to our community. So we broke them up into two categories. And we added some question marks here because in the analysis that we looked at, they didn't identify net zero buildings as having individual agency. We think it does. We think if you're going to make a decision about whether to build the influence you may have on your own consumer decisions, we think about composting down here as a very personal matter, something that we can have agency for. So, this, we think, is sort of the basis or the foundation for building a current personal climate action plan. I got the question at the door tonight. I got the question at the door tonight. Um, I'm one person, what can I do? I get this all the time. Um, I've asked it myself, of course, over, over many years. And the answer is plenty. And when you combine those efforts with millions of other ones, the cumulative effect is astounding. We're not working in a bubble, people. We're working together. And there's another 100,000 groups like this right this minute talking about doing the same kinds of things. So it becomes exponential in the fact that we are thinking about this at this level. 
Step that up to influence our friends and family. Remember when AT&T had that thing, friends and fam family plan? And you get your friends and your family to do the same thing. What's Johnny got a Fitbit, I want one too. So that's the one to 10. Work up to your local government. I'm pretty sure everybody knows everybody in our governments, our local governments. And that's the one to 100 at most. <coughs> Pretty soon we're combining the efforts of 10,000 people from each of our towns until we're at the sweet spot of community engagement of 100,000 for the Peconic Bay region. So we're recommending everybody start with a personal climate action plan. I know we've tasked ourselves with creating this so we could actually hand it out. What things are important to me? I, you don't have to take the notes. We will do that. Um, expand it organically and exponentially into a regional climate action plan. Um, two quick concepts on tipping points. There are two kinds that I've identified so far, I'm sure there are more. One is the positive feedback loop, where the temperature, for example, increases and the ice melts, and the sun is no longer reflected into space from the Arctic, which creates more heat, and so on. Positive here does not mean wonderful. It means adding to itself and compounding the condition geometrically. We also have social tipping points. One person, the innovator, gets another person to join, like Dar, right? And then five, and then 20. And then the whole crowd is dancing on the side of the hill. For many social conditions, not all, one, two, five, twenty percent tipping points work very well. And there's another reason we're here today. After being immersed in our condition for 13 years now, I honestly think we have reached the 20 percent condition, which will be the tipping point into broad positive social change. Without a vision, there's no mission. Without a mission, there are no goals. Without goals, no strategy, no strategy, no action, and that's where we need to start today. Our shared vision must be a thriving region in land, water, and air. Our mission, to work at every turn toward that vision, with our goals being measurable outcomes in parts per million, for example. Our strategy is straightforward, and we're asking you to act. We have all the tools we need right here, right now. We are not creating activists, we are training effectivists. People who can carry out one very personal and important and meaningful action which ties together into the thousands of actions needed to create a healthy planet, which is in balance once again. A concept I learned from a very bright woman in India about 30 years ago is the idea of leapfrogging technology. It wasn't her term, it's, I've come up with it since. Her poor little village of about 250 people had no telephone service caused a lot of stress and anxiety because their children and their, their grandchildren had left the area and they, and they lived in the big city when they moved away, so there's no way to keep in touch. They were about 100 miles away from the near central office, and just like Verizon told Aquabog, we will never see Fios, they told this village that they would never see copper. They would never see a telephone line in their lives. So. She goes down to the town, she contracts a cell phone, a cell phone tower company to build a tower in her village, she buys a box of 200 telephones, and she gives them to everybody in her village. She had leapfrogged over the linear path of technology and created a solution years in advance of eventuality or not. I suggest that we use the same exponential approach to do several things, and I may be disinvited from your committee as a result of this. Next comment. <laughs> to create decentralized energy in microgrids to create resilience, here's the good one. I propose that we leapfrog the linear path of cesspools to denitrification systems to gray water use and go straight to composting toilets and urine separation and collection. I maintain that we need to greenscape our towns and brownscape and softscape our towns to mitigate water, stormwater runoff as repairs are made. And we need to put a plan together which acknowledges the town of Montauk's move inland to create adaptation rather than simply reacting to disruptions and property loss and apply that approach to all of our at-risk coastal properties over the next 20 years. Our task is to reach net zero or carbon balance by 2050. Using the theory of doubling or halving, this means we would have to reduce our emissions by only 7.5% per year over 10 years. Every 10 years. This will not be enough. We waited too long, and now we need to make this an exponential effort as 50% reductions in every decade until 2050. 
There's a thing called the Seneca curve. Take the speaker with me. Okay, come on, Rob. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Take the speaker. Okay. Um, there's a thing called the Seneca curve, and if we do, if we had done this in 2000, this is what the curve of reduction would look like in emissions or carbon dioxide or whatever, whatever it is that you're studying. The longer you wait, the sharper this curve becomes, until we turn to this point when the curve turns like this. So the longer we had, the longer we could take, the, sh the longer we take, the shorter the curve. And that's called the Seneca curve. All right? We're starting to hit that Seneca curve right now. A lot of ugly things happen when the Seneca curve is, is the only thing we can do. New buildings have a life cycle of 30 or 50, 70 years. This is what Rob is talking about. Um, these are the big rocks that Danella and, and, and uh, her husband talked about, uh, Dennis Meadows. Uh, in systems theory that we need to move the big rocks. We're not going to be sweeping the sand off of the highway to let cars through. We're going to move the big rocks first. And one of the big rocks that we have to move become our priorities. Whatever rocks those are, we need to move the big rocks first. Regeneration on the whole will bring us countless cascading benefits if we take an honest look at the science of drawdown that we have in our hands today. Uh, th th this work, I Dar will tell you, I was in the car back in September. We went to uh, Pennsylvania, the Penn State the Drawdown Conference, and she showed me this, this spreadsheet that Rob had done. She, she says, look at this. I said, oh, I gotta have that, I gotta have that. It took her like seven weeks to send it to me. I don't know, I don't know. It wasn't done. Um, it looks like it's done now. We're, we're always working on it, it's a live document, but my dream was to integrate the sustainability development goals from the UN along with the, um, the nine planetary boundaries that came up from Stockholm years before that, to put that into Drawdown, to put that into the Sustainability 400, to put it into the Peconic Estuary Partners pro, uh, CCMP, the master program, into our town codes, into our master plans, so that all of these things finally, they're all in front of us today, right now. We will always rely on flexibility and innovation as key components to a successful reactive response, which is learning from the past to maintain our present course. But bravery and courage are the key components to a proactive approach by which we will create our future. Stop being afraid of what could go wrong and think of what could go right. Thank you. It is, and it's also positive reward um, training. Um, I'm involved with a lot of psychology and behaviorism that goes along with behavior change and having these things actually happen. Whether, whether it's um, the behavior of your town board or the behavior of your, your state government or the behavior of your next door neighbor. Um, like I said, I've been piling up newspaper at the, and cardboard at the curb for 50 years, and we're still not doing it. So that social norm has to change by positive reward. Right? There's no negative punishment for throwing out cardboard. Right? That, that there's positive reward, there's negative punishment, there's positive punishment and negative, negative reward um, in that quadrant. And positive reward, I think, 
and, and I know for a fact from training dogs for a really long time that positive reward training is the absolute best. No, we don't hit them anymore. <laughs> we don't. Uh, and I know the guy in front of you probably likes the idea of uh, a carbon uh, dividend at his farm. Um, we've got to figure out how to get that done, and we're working with Cornell on figuring out how the, what those metrics look like. The people in Iowa have been doing no-till farming now for about 10 years. But it's not going to come from me telling them to do no-till no farming. It's going to come from people like Phil. It's going to come from their own industry. And that's what we're here to do. Is we're here to put other industry leaders together, whether it's restaurants talking to restaurants, or if it's schools talking to schools, or town boards talking to town boards, to the tree committees. Um, I, I don't I know anything about trees. and I've, I've said this before publicly. But I can sure help you get together so that your tree people can man manage this and make this happen. Any other questions? Yeah. No, maybe not so much questions as a comment. I mean, I've been studying this stuff and living, living with it a long time. What's your name? Steve Storch. I work with uh, biodynamic, organic farming, make products. Um, and carbon is only part of the problem. You talk about the agriculture, regenerative, organic, biodynamic, whatever it is. You know, since like the mid 1800s, they've been on this quest for synthetic nitrogen. And the first process in 1848 was very slow and cumbersome. But in 1910, they came up with the Haber Bosch process, which is now drawing down nitrogen gas out of the atmosphere to make 120 million metric tons of nitrogen a year. So, you know, this stuff is getting, and when that happens in nature, you create a void like that, it comes back in. And now it's all in bags getting spread all over the place. And this is creating a havoc in the atmosphere that is not being recognized. You know, red tides, fairy circles in pastures, all these very weird things are going on. And I don't know, a month ago there was a me the meeting about Agawam at, at the Southampton Press put on. And somebody brought up, well, why can't we ban, you know, ban pesticides and fertilizer and stuff? And well, that's federal, that's state. You can't do it locally. And the first thing they do is they give up. And there are places where they ban Roundup and cosmetic landscape pesticides like in uh, Tacoma Park, Maryland. Okay, so unless we, you know, we take control, these, a lot of these chemicals are tested in places where there's bedrock not a sole source aquifer. So, you know, in my thinking, I have a lot of questions about really actual, the actual science about what's being talked about here. There's, well, other, there's other components that are really affecting things. And I also feel that by, you know, talking about carbon and these things, you're putting it on us when there are way bigger, more powerful forces to think that they can make 120 million metric tons of a polluting fertilizer and get it distributed and put in the hands of people all over the world. I mean, I've seen it in Africa and all over this country for sure, you know, and there's other things that need to be added to the conversation. Yeah, they're big Basically conversations. Basically what I'm saying, it's a big conversation. It is. And then we've got to have experts and, and when you get down to the bottom of it, there's going to be a lot of, a lot of detail. A lot of science. Uh, the nitrogen cycle, the hydrological cycle, the carbon cycle, um, they all interact, right? So absolutely. Yeah. So these will have to be talked about at some other <laughs> some other library. <laughs> Not with me tonight. No, I'm, but I'm saying it needs to be part of the conversation. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, I don't absolutely. Think I feel like you don't be putting this on everybody to do something. Well, do what you can. I'm not asking you to do the things you can't do, like the nuclear power plant. Um, to do the things no, I, we can. I, I think it's totally doable, but I think we have to hold people's feet to the fire. Like the town can't just say, "Oh, that's federal." We can do like you know, find out what, how much effort it takes to go to a town board meeting and get to speak for three minutes, mm -hmm. and they give you the gavel, and sit down. It takes hours out of my day to go mm -hmm. try and do that, and there's no, you can't get anything done like that. So we need 30 people to get up and stand up and say the same thing, and we were talking about that number. But any, you know, that's my two cents. Suffolk County was the first county to um, to ban um, DDT in the United States. It was also the first county to ban phosphates from our laundry detergent. Am I clothes still look pretty good? 
So we, like I said, we talk about bravery. We talk about fearlessness. But to your point, Steve, uh, it's entitled here nutrient management, and you can see the scales in which we have some that we can be involved with. And so out here at P7 plus is a really big number. It is the side of this, you know, we're approaching countries here or continents. But there is a, a sweet spot that says with nutrient management at P4, which is our region. So local conversations everywhere. It's not simply waiting for the federal government to be involved with addressing issues such as nutrient management, because it ties in completely into regenerative agriculture or conservation agriculture. <coughs> but to say nothing else of the land use, the coastal wetlands issues, and the like. Yes. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> thanks for the presentation um, to both of you. I'm, I'm a newcomer. I just arrived a few months ago in Southampton. Um, and just a couple of things that kind of struck me in, in this last point about, you know, how do you get local politicians to, to start to be on, on the listening side and, and more actively involved? And it just, it strikes me what you said about, you know, how hard it is to, to get a three-minute slot. But I just, I can't imagine, I mean, I don't know what, what it is that, that actually, you know, flips the switch and, and, and gets the, the, the mayor and, the, and the, the trustees of the local board to listen, but with the meetings that I've attended so far and with the network that exists, um, you know, is it not possible, rather than one or two people to go in and have that agenda item and have their three minutes to, you know, really lay it down and say we've got 50 people who are going to come to this meeting tonight for this one issue because it's so important to this community listen up and maybe give us six minutes instead of three minutes is is that just you know totally impossible or it, it, the way the politics work locally uh, but it just seems that you know there's power in numbers and I get the sense that there's enough you know uh, you were saying we've already reached uh, the 20 percent we've got you know one in five already is that not possible to, to really start to demand that there's a, a serious discussion on the part of local politicians, whether it's at the village level or the town level? But it just seems to me that there's enough of, a, of an active network that, that that could change. The last words you had up there, be fearless. I think that's also really important. It's a common theme. Um, and when you turn it around, from something negative to something positive, then people start to wake up and they start to listen because all we hear about in the media today is negative, negative, negative. Yep. There's so many positive things happening in so many different realms in the world today, but we don't hear about it because that's not what sells. <clears throat> and so, is it possible, and I know, I think, you know, in some discussions with Mary, she's mentioned the website is developing for Drawdown now, that's, that's, that's an active, uh, that's a thing that's 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 you know in progress right now, and we've even talked a little bit about how do you get the local press to really start to now be sending out that message in a regular way that it's a positive thing. It's not just a doom and gloom. So I mean I think you know you're the you're the people who are on the scene right here and, and know what's possible and what's not. But those seem to me to be a couple of areas that wouldn't be so difficult to kind of make a, a, a difference in relatively quickly. Um, let me respond to what you just said. Um, my name is Dieter van Leesten. I am co-chair of the Southampton Town Sustainability Committee. <clears throat> we are a conduit from the people to the government. We are all volunteers and we have the ear of the government. That means we are going, picking items, many of these in here, the famous Southampton 400 plan that originated with this committee. So what we are doing is, before it ever goes to public hearings for the three minutes, we have been talking to them for sometimes weeks, months, and years to get something going. So we have their ear, and we're getting things going. So the involvement of individuals, for instance, you could join our committee and become, become a member, and you're getting actively involved in all these many, many things which Drawdown does and what we are doing parallel to that. Or, or in combination of that. So the three minute thing is only the very last thing of the public hearing. Before that, there is a lot of 
ways to talk to the government, and they're listening. They're not somewhere sitting on, on a high throne. So if you'd like to be involved, happy to have you. We need people, we are all volunteers, to get these things going, which these two gentlemen have so actively and very well prepared and uh, conveyed to you. Thank you. Thank you, dear. Start with raising hand. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about ideas that you've had about PCAP and how that might come to fruition. One of the things that we could do is to involve as many people once this is flushed out. And we elaborate on how, what our options are with any particular category here. I think we should target 100 people or 300 people in our community and ask them to be involved, volunteer to be in the program. See if you can actually make, meet certain targets that you've set for yourself or your family. And then we can share that information with each other. We can see how effective we can be. We can share the results of how we've done. The knowledge provide a basis of data uh, for, to help other people. But in those conversations of what we're doing is building this kind of scales of optimization. Because this is an ongoing thing. So if we can get a sufficient number of people to commit to doing something like this, there are two right there, I know. P3. P3. I do want to um, point out one thing here, but I find this fascinating. <laughs> Down here, we haven't spoken a lot about women and girls, educating girls and family planning. It kind of dropped away, but we know the significance of women and their decision making and purchasing power, not only in this country, but worldwide. And the optimum scale, the sweet spot is two. The DART has a group called 100 women for women. <laughs> so that's another example of how to scale these conversations. Is that helpful? Yes. Um, thanks for being here and talking about this. Does there exist some kind of key for each one of these things so we know what they mean? I mean, I, I mean, I have a general idea when I read the, the boxes of what we're talking about, but, but shouldn't your, your goal be to be as simple and clear about what these things are as possible? And I don't see that happening here. I get it. But it requires a certain amount of reading and study. That okay, we, then direct us to that. Do we have, I, I need to know where to go. <laughs> I, I need to know... Who's going to draw down book? Well, we have the draw down, we, we draw -down book. Is okay. That, is that what it is? So we just have to go to the book and read the chapters on these things. Is that what it is? That's a fabulous introduction. Okay. But right. I would suggest that it, it, because you're interested, right, there may be things that if you were interested in undertaking a personal climate action plan, you may be able to look at various things here that are suggested that are at a scale of 1 or 10 in your family and see how many things that you can think about. And the developmental side of what we hope to do is provide a great deal of information to expand upon for an individual or family how you would go about doing it, what are some of the common choices that you make. And I'll try to provide some framework by which the individual can measure their accomplishments. Remember, if we're calling it a climate action plan, we need some baseline for ourselves for all the relevant things in which we add the carbon footprint in our lives. I and mean, so we need some way by which to evaluate them. And they exist in various forms. We're trying to, if you will, tailor it to draw down. And the numbers are referring to draw down, which Stephen and Dr. Yeah, the numbers beside refer to the solution. The solution. Okay. That's, the, that's the relative. Worldwide way of that particular solution. Okay. It's not core. It's not correlated to the way the actual weight in our community. But that's its worldwide. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Um, so 
So I've been coordinating the Alliance for Global Resilience and Regeneration and working with Could you, could you stop talking to the mic? Oh, sorry. Um, my name is Mike McDonald, and I've been coordinating the Alliance for Global Resilience and Regeneration. And this year, um, we're identifying 400 communities around the world in 100 bioregions um, that we want to uh, identify as being um, committed to surviving this century uh, through climate resilience and regeneration. And the East End is one of the regions that we're interested in, and we're interested in identifying specific communities. So one of the things that I'm wondering about is if we could, um, I believe there's something around 45 hamlets and villages in the East End. Does anybody know exactly what it is? Something like, something like that. Um, if we could have a competition of which hamlets and villages actually do, do this best, um, and try to do it on a yearly basis, ideally, but um, at least get it uh, on the list so that we could have a Hamlet, you know, let's just say it's Montauk, um, uh, uh, to be one of the 400, maybe we could have more, um, with the idea then that we could start getting funding in to build models um, uh, around these natural, uh, uh, experiments that you're beginning to create a data structure for. Um, and the question I have is uh, related to the goal that we're shooting for is to create blue-green economies. Um, and uh, I'm imagining that within the New York metropolitan area, the East End and probably the Hudson Valley have the best shot at uh, actually surviving the, the, the century in terms of moving toward climate resilience and regeneration. So um, could we become a model bioregion which may have a few of these uh, truly um, innovative communities that are actually beginning to um, create products and services with significant trade and economic value. Because unless we've got um, an economy, and eventually a political economies that will support these efforts, it's going to be pretty hard to achieve what we're going to need to achieve. And I'm just wondering if this is something that we could integrate. I'm not nearly that advanced in my idea, but I think if we get to the point where we have enough people enrolled in doing a personal climate action plan, there's a reason that it hasn't happened at all of these various levels, at the county level, at the state level. It's hard, but as we figure out what we need to measure, that attracts people who know how to measure that, or more importantly, creates opportunities for jobs for people who can do this measurement and help us. So I think um, one of my heroes is Jane Jacobson in her systems of survival. She talks, or um, cities and the wealth of nations, whatever. Um, that, that's what she's best known for, but she wrote another book, The Economy of Cities, and the best two things for cities to maintain their relevancy is innovation and import replacing. So if we replace the inputs that we're bringing in from the outside with our local jobs, creating people who know about resilient um, systems and economies, not the ones that we have now, we would want to replace those with other people. So anyway, I'm just thinking, if we can get enough people enrolled with the personal climate action plan, that's where we start. And then we've got 100 to 1,000 people who are committed to doing their own thing. And then we show up at the government and we say, okay, we can do it. Why can't you? Or we'll help you, whatever. We're all in this together.
I just wanted to address the gentleman's question about how to uh, redraw down and see what can I do. We've been giving workshops at this library, thanks to Dar and her sister, who have, uh, and we're just volunteers, reading the book and trying to answer the question, what can I do? So please go to our website, add your name to our list. We'll be doing more of these intro workshops. Uh, the one I give talks about the wild idea that, you know, uh, that Drawdown has said a quarter of our emissions are food related, our food system and land use. So they, their calculation is that if Americans reduce our food waste by 50%, um, we can achieve the drawdown goal, which is a conservative goal, uh, an achievable goal of emissions drawdown by 20 it, it, You know, we're looking through the chapters to try to get that information for you. Pardon? There's no food waste now. Great, <laughs> fantastic. I gotta tell you, I bought the book when it came out, and it sat on my coffee table. It's a beautiful book. Um, I didn't know what to do with it. I had no idea what to do with it. And when I met Dar and the crew, they, they were doing the uh, talk here a year ago, and all of a sudden, it's like, well, when you break it down, food waste means this, and energy means this, and so on. That's when the light went on. So we're writing programs right now. We're handing them off. We're writing programs. Uh, for behavior change, uh, whether it's organic food waste, uh, food waste to an organic farm. Um, and there's going to be, the, the way I'm figuring it, there's going to be probably better part of 400 programs. So any one of these things you can get involved with. But we haven't got anybody doing concrete. I mean, somebody talked about concrete was really important. Concrete is one-to-one. -one. A ton of concrete gives off a ton of CO2. So if you want to look for alternatives to concrete, green concrete, whatever, the, polymerized crushed glass, I mean, there's so many things out there. We have no time for this, all right? If you want to do the research and you want to come up with concrete and then bring it into the community to say, this is how we should be. I know a lot of it is low impact, uh, not stress related, uh, you know, as far as buildings are concerned, um, but that would be your calling. That would be your drawdown. And there's there's 400 of them in there. It, one, one of these things, like retrofit, plumbing, electric, carpentry, uh, land use, parking lots, runoff, heat islands, a AC. Yes. yes. You know, like if you come down County Road 39, you come into town, and it's like the most disgusting disaster you've ever seen. You know, you've never been on 58 then in Riverdale. Yeah. <laughs> I think they should do all these things in three-story parking garages with green roofs, so you don't have to plow the snow, uh -huh. you don't have to park in the sun, and bake the place out. Yeah. It's the most ridiculous thing, uh -huh. and you know, they think they've got this great County Road 39 development plan. Yeah. It's primitive. Yeah. And that's, you know, that to me is a big problem. These people in government are so unimaginative. Well, that's a tough spot. It is a tough spot. It's a tough it's, spot. It's, you know how, what? Yeah, how would you like to be us? And you're telling us this you stuff. Go. And they don't want to change their ways. What's that about? We may have it's a simple our, solution. We may have tested patients hour and a half. We encourage anyone who'd like to stick around and continue the conversation with us for a few minutes for these two. But thank you all for coming. Little announcements, and that is if you'd like to know more about drug on programs and you're not already on our mailing list, please sign that sheet back there. Or go to drawdowneastend.org and you can sign up there. We've got uh, Drawdown 100 Women for Women coming up the monthly meeting on March 9th at 7 o'clock at the Hayground School monthly program. And also we are uh, doing a giant kickoff on food waste. And we're looking at the supply end of uh, reducing food waste, which is the number three solution. Cray Van Sickle is heading that up. And that will be on March 4th at the Unitarian Church at the peculiar time of 4.45. Um, so check that out too, but we'll send you information about that if you want. And um, I have to say that I have been working with these folks on this material, and it is so complex, and there have been so many hundreds of sheets of analysis, and. This is a gift to actually see the simplification of it. And possibly we could get them to, a, 
to send it to us. If, if there are groups that you want to share this information with, let us know and we'll find out about that. But I cannot tell you how much effort has gone into this miraculous work and it will change the way that we work with our governments and it will bring it will bring us to that thriving place we want on the East End where we have clean water, clean air, and clean land along with everyone else in the world. So thank you so much for this.